On today's Locked On Jayhawks, we preview the KU basketball season. You are Locked On Jayhawks, your daily podcast on the Kansas Jayhawks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Derek Johnson. You can hear me as well on Rock Chalk Sports Talk from Monday through Friday on KLWN and Lawrence from 3 to 6 o'clock. Thanks for making Locked On Jayhawks your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. On today's edition of Locked On Jayhawks, we are going to preview the KU basketball season a week out from their first exhibition game. I'd like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across the Locked On College Network. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply KU basketball a week away from the start of the season. Uh, I want to kind of go over what I think some of their biggest strengths identities, maybe the biggest questions are going to be headed into the season here. Obviously KU football on a bye this week. So it gives us more time to kind of cross over between the two sports. I, I think the biggest strengths for this team, one, if you're just looking like positionally, um, KU could have the the best wing position in college basketball. Jalen Wilson is going to be a Big 12 Player of the Year candidate. If you're a Big 12 Player of the Year candidate, you're an All-American candidate. Kevin McCuller is going to be an All-Big 12 candidate and is arguably the best defender perimeter-wise in college basketball with his multi versatility. He was the best defender on the best defensive team in the country last year in Texas Tech, so it's not that crazy of a claim. And then you also have Grady Dick and MJ Rice, these two five-star freshmen. Grady Dick, you're expecting big things from as a shooter. We heard from Bill Self at Media Day that maybe MJ Rice, it's going to take a little longer to get there. He reminds him a little bit of Wayne Selden, which if you remember, Wayne Selden finished out fantastic year as a junior, but it took him a little bit longer to maybe get accustomed with everything. They have really good wing play. And if you add KJ Adams into this too, who is kind of a, a wing center hybrid for what this team is going to do, then it just gives you even more talent, more defense on that end of the floor. So they have all sorts of wing talent, maybe the best in the country, certainly one of the best. And that is really going to allow you to play positionless, to play switchable defense, especially in today's age of college basketball. It's what they did last year when they had one of the best wing teams in the country and they were able to mix and match in a lot of different ways and, and have a lot of success doing that. So that is super helpful and that's going to be an identity of this team. Um, I also think because of that, and because you also have Dewan Harris kind of leading the show, you're going to have a really good transition team once again. I feel like that's going to continue on from where it was last year. Whether it is Dewan Harris, Kevin McCuller, Jalen Wilson, uh, Grady Dick, MJ Rice, any of these guys that grab the rebound are going to be able to grab and go. And that was such a strength of last year's team. They were lethal in transition, and that was maybe their biggest strength last season altogether. They should be really good at it this year. I don't know if they'll be quite as good as they were last year because Christian Brown was a menace in transition, was so good at finishing with all these kind of odd, awkward finishes or floaters or whatnot. Um, Ochag Baji ran the floor so hard, but they still have some really good pieces to be really good in transition. Guys that can handle the ball, can grab and go on the break. That They sh still should be really good in that regard, as far as an identity of this team, I do think they're going to be a pretty good defensive team. Um, there are certainly questions about who's going to be the five man for KU and the interior defense will be a question there. But the ability to throw out Kevin McCuller and Dewan Harris, who could be the best duo of perimeter defenders in the Big 12, combining with, you know, the possibility of having if Jalen Wilson plays defensively like he did over the final maybe month of last season. And then if you do get some sort of defensive presence from Ernest Uday or Zuby Edgefer, who have been shot blockers at their previous level, or KJ Adams comes in and you can be switchable one through five, there are a lot of options for this team to be really good on the defensive end of the court. I have no idea how Grady Dick and MJ Rice are going to do defensively. Usually with freshmen coming in, especially under Bill Self, it takes a little bit of time to be good on that side of the ball. But in terms of just the physical traits, you look at both guys, you're looking at you know, in the case of Grady Dick, 6'7", six, 6'8", six, wing, who is pretty athletic, and you're looking at MJ Rice as a 6'5", linebacker of a wing, like clearly they both would have potential to be at least solid defenders at the collegiate level. Um, I think that'll be a good identity for this team. I also think that this is going to be a team who uh, is going to be really good at being able to drive 
to the rim and finishing around the rim with all those different wing options that they have. Now, as far as maybe my biggest questions for this team coming into the year, the first would be the three-point shooting. Grady Dick sounds like he is translating super well that he's going to be a good three-point shooter for this team. But, you know, how much do you really want to rely on a true freshman coming in and and picking up where Ochag Baji left off, right? Like Grady Dick could have a really good shooting season as a freshman, and he might shoot 36%. And if that's your best three-point shooter, it's going to be, you know, tough to weather the storm. Now, a lot of this kind of relies on how much better did certain guys coming back uh, get at three-point shooting, like Jalen Wilson, who shot under 30% from three last season. I think it was 26%. Can he get up to 33%? Can he get up to 34%? By all accounts, over the offseason, sounds like he improved his shooting a lot. And, you know, the longer you're in college basketball, especially under Bill Self and KU, we see that improve all the time. So I would believe that it did get a lot better, but just how much better is going to be key. Uh, with Kevin McCuller, kind of same thing, 29% from Texas Tech last year. That's kind of been uh, where he's been at for the majority of his collegiate career. So can he get up to 33%? Dewan Harris, I think, is going to be a proficient three-point shooter, but how many attempts are you realistically going to take? Is it just going to be something like the past couple of years where it's, hey, if you're left alone on an island and you get a pass, you can catch it off off the uh, or, or shoot it off the catch? Or is it something where, He's now added to his game where, like we saw with Frank Mason his senior year, where if he's dribbling and a defender goes under the screen and leaves him a couple feet of space, he can get it off and he can shoot that open three and knock that down as well. Can he take that kind of next step with MJ Rice? Like he's been known as more of a streaky shooter and and a scorer than maybe just a pure shooter. So what are you going to get? out of that with Joe Yesfu struggled a lot from three last year. Can he get back to what he was at Drake in terms of the three point shooting to come on Bobby Pettiford? That wasn't really his strength of shooting. Kyle Cuff's a great athlete. I don't know how much the shooting is there. And then you look at, you know, KJ Adams, like that's the question for him. What about shooting? You would think that, Oh, if Zach Clements or Cam Martin's going to be playing at the five, that will alleviate some of the concerns because they can be a pick and pop big man and they can shoot. But if, if those guys aren't able to establish a role or Ernest Dude or Zuby Edgefer, KJ Adams is playing more of the five, that's less minutes you have a three-point shooter on the floor with one of your centers. And on top of that, we've seen other, you know, big men, four fives for KU, be good shooters from the outside. Perry Ellis, Marcus Morris, Markeith Morris, right? We've seen other big men who have been able to stretch it out and shoot threes. Typically, those guys only get one and a half, maybe two, three point attempts per game. Maybe it would go up to three with Zach Clements. But the point is, if you're taking, let's just say hypothetically, you took 23s in a game. Um, Ochai was getting, I forget, it was like seven or eight a game last season. Like Svi was kind of the same thing, six, seven, eight. Let's say Grady Dick shoots six of your threes per game. Um, That leaves you with 14 other threes that guys are going to take. If your center is taking combined between Zach Clements and Cam Martin, let's say even four between the two of them, which that might even be too much. I'm probably closer to three would be the realistic answer. That still leaves you with 10 three point shots, which if the rest of the team is only shooting 30 percent, you know, it's going to make things a little bit difficult for KU on that end. So the three point shooting is my biggest question outside of that. It's it's who can develop as being that like go to score in crunch time. They had Ochag Baji, but also you had Christian Brown or Remy Martin to be able to get you out of a rut and get you a tough bucket when the shot clock was winding, winding down at the end of last season. Who's going to be that guy this year? I think Jalen Wilson can do it. I mean, we saw it a lot his uh, red shirt freshman year, but can he do it efficiently? Uh, can you have multiple guys to do it? Because that's really the key. Okay, you had Ochai, like I said. Okay, you had Christian Brown, who could make a shot driving to the rim at the end of the shot clock or shoot a contested three and make it. Remy Martin was able to kind of shake and, and whatnot. So uh, that's going to be the question for this KU team. Do you have enough guys who can score for you kind of late in the shot clock like you did last season and shooting? Those are my two biggest questions. I, I guess you could add how quickly does it take or, or how slow does it take the freshmen to kind of uh, figure things out on – really both ends of the court and and to feel like they are living up to their potential and they are maximizing their talent. In just a moment, we are going to get on to some more KU basketball season preview talk. We're going to project the rotation and the starting lineups to predict to uh, start the season. But first these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be a hundred percent certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn jobs. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster 
and for free. It's super easy to post your job on there. And I can't tell you how many times I'm scrolling through LinkedIn, seeing what other people are up to, and I'll see a job available. Not that I'm looking for anything right now, but it just shows you how visible it is for everyone. And it makes it easy for people because they're doing the same thing. And it's a lot easier to be scrolling through that and just click a button on your phone and be like, hey, you know what? I'm going to apply for this or on your computer. Add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors, and you want to finish the year strong, right? Kansas basketball wants to start the year strong here, which you might want to do because if you finish 2022 strong, you start 2023 strong as well. KU football looking to finish out the year strong with another win to get to a bowl game. You can finish the year strong too. You got holiday sales coming up, or you're just trying to fill out that job. End the year on a good note. Finish out the year strong with LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Okay, so KU uh, coming into the season, you bring back DeWan Harris, Jalen Wilson from the starting lineup. You feel confident those guys are going to play big roles. Obviously, Kevin McCuller, you expect. Uh, Bill Self said it at uh, Late Night in the Fog, I forget if it was a media availability or on the broadcast, that he kind of feels like the four he feels good about with you know Dewan Harris and McCuller and Wilson and Grady Dick. They're trying to figure out the five. So I don't necessarily have an answer for you at the five, but here's what we're going to go through for the starting lineup and rotation. Here's my guess for the starting five to begin the year. Dewan Harris, Kevin McCuller, Grady Dick, Jalen Wilson, and how about KJ Adams? Let's go with KJ Adams. I think that one's interesting here. Um, the reason why, again, this is a complete guess and ask me again in two days and I'll probably pick a different center. I was going Zach Clements for the longest time, but I think that it's apparent to me Bill Self wants the defensive side of the ball, especially from the interior. And maybe it won't be KJ Adams because he wants someone to throw to in the post as well. But I kind of wonder if right off the bat, at the beginning of the season, he just goes with the guy he trusts the most. And who does he trust the most among the centers? K.J. Adams. He was on the floor for the final play of the national championship. And, yes, you have certain maybe ceiling limitations with him at the five with not being able to throw to him in the post and, and have somebody who can score for you there and not having a true rim protector on the other end. But it also does open you up to, to playing switchable one through five, which in its own right is a big strength that you can play. And... He just, like I said, I think you have the most trust in what K.J. Adams would be right now, so I wouldn't be surprised if he was the starter to begin the season. Uh, if I'm asking about it to end the year, wouldn't surprise me if you have like Ernest Uday, who I think of the center group for what Bill Self wants to do. I think Ernest Uday has the highest ceiling for this team. Like I think Zuby Edgefer might end up being better than Ernest Uday right off the bat, might be more college-ready. You could argue Zach Clements has a higher ceiling because of his ability to shoot the three ball. But for what specifically Bill Self wants, I wouldn't be surprised if Ernest Uday, uh, maybe you ease him into it at the beginning of the year, and then he eventually is that starter. Figuring out the rotation. So you have 40 minutes to give out at the number one spot, point guard, lead guard spot. Dewan Harris, uh, how many minutes is he going to get? Right, he, he played 29 minutes a game last year, so clearly it's going to be more than that. And when Bill Self trusts a point guard, they play massive minutes. Like Devon Dotson, his sophomore year, played 35 minutes per game. Devontae Graham, his senior year, played 38. Frank Mason played 36 his senior year. So if I said 32 minutes for Dewan Harris, that might be conservative. Like it might, it wouldn't shock me if Dewan Harris played 35 minutes a game. But we'll go a little conservative here. We'll give him 32 minutes per game. We'll give the other eight to Bobby Pettiford. Bill Self said he envisions Pettiford winning the race for the backup point guard role. I think Joe Yesfu is going to be more used in a combo guard role a two guard role um but we'll go with bobby pettiford the other eight minutes there now you have 120 minutes to divvy out between the wing positions or the two through four based on how you want to play with three wings which is mainly how they played last year or with a two guard lineup and two wings kind of next to it um so jalen wilson again like you could convince me he could play 35 minutes a game if he's a big 12 player of the year candidate but we'll go a little less aggressive there we'll go 32 minutes per game for jalen wilson Kevin McCuller, again, if if he's going to have all the trust in the world and be this all Big 12 defender, 
and is multi-versatile with the different positions he can play, you could convince me Bill Self's going to play him 32, 34 minutes per game. But we'll go conservative again. 30 minutes for Kevin McCuller. Grady Dick. This one you could convince me it's 22 minutes per game. You could convince me it's 30 minutes per game. How much does the shot impact things, and how much can he pick up some of the other sides of the court, like the defensive side, or is he just going to be like a you know Isaiah Moss or Christian Brown freshman year, where those guys were playing like 20 minutes per game as basically your sharpshooter, but you know they weren't going to get 30 minutes per game necessarily because um, you just had other guys that could play and you also had other things that you needed besides just the shooting. So that one's going to, I think have a high variance, but we'll just go with 28 minutes. I think that might be fair for a guy who would be a starter, uh, which if you do that between those three, Jalen at 32, Kevin McCuller at 30 and Grady Dick at 28, that leaves you with a grand total of 30 minutes. That's it. 30 minutes to divvy out between the rest of the players uh, who can play the two through four, which would be MJ Rice, KJ Adams, Joe Yesifu, and Bobby Pettiford, and Kyle Cuff, if if you want to add him in there too. So that's not a lot of minutes to go around. Um, basically, though, I think that with MJ Rice, it is going to be more of a developmental year. So maybe we go with like 15 minutes per game. Wouldn't be surprised if it gets up to 20 or 25, but we'll go with 15 minutes per game for MJ Rice. That leaves you with 15 more to give out. I think KJ Adams is going to play a role on this team. He's just so versatile. He's such a good defender. So we'll give him seven minutes on the wing as like a three or four man. And then the rest of his minutes are going to come at the center. And then maybe you play a stretch with two point guards or two lead guards next to each other. So we'll give the other eight minutes to one of, or maybe a combo of Joe Yesfu and Bobby Pettiford. So for Pettiford, if he wins out all those two minutes, he can basically play up to 15, 16 minutes per game. Or you could have like eight minutes from Pettiford, eight minutes from Joe Yesifu. You know, maybe it's between eight to 10, depending on the game for either of those two players. Realistically, we see Bill Self go with the guy he trusts. But in the early going of the season, I'm sure there will be a lot of tinkering and split minutes between these players. But once we get to the end of the year, Big 12 play, February, March, that sort of thing, you're probably just going to stick to one of those two with Joe Yesifu or Bobby Pettiford, barring foul trouble or the occasional weird matchup that favors them. Now, the 40 minutes at center, I don't even really want to divvy out uh, how this is going to work because, like I said, I have no idea. Like, what if KJ Adams just plays 8 to 12 minutes at center? Zach Clements plays 8 to 12. Er Ernest Uday plays 8 to 12. Zuby Edge for 8 to 12. I think that could happen in the opening part of the season. Maybe it's basically for each game you pick three centers who are going to play that specific game, and then maybe a fourth plays like five minutes in the early going. And then by the time maybe they've ironed some of these questions out or we get toward the conference play or or they finally pick a guy that they feel most comfortable with, maybe by then you have one guy playing 20, 22 minutes. You have another guy playing 10 to 12 to 15, and then another guy's playing 5 to 8. That's kind of my guess. Pick and choose however you want. Like I said, I think Zuby Edgefer wouldn't surprise me if he is the guy because I think he could be more college ready. He had a huge Nike UIPL circuit and played really well against high competition. I think Ernest Duday might have the highest ceiling of those traditional centers of the rim runners and, and stuff like that. I think Zach Clements obviously has a high potential with his three-point shooting. Maybe go with the experience of Cam Martin. K.J. Adams, I think, is going to play and, and have minutes there and have you play a different way with that multi-versatility. I do think that Zach Clemens was my vote earlier, but it doesn't sound like Bill Self is as excited um, that he has maybe excelled in the offseason, that that hasn't really happened to the liking of KU, and that he would be fine running a pick-and-pop offense. But, you know, whenever I ask my wife something like, hey, what do you want to do for dinner? Let's do this or whatever. She says, "Eh, that's fine. I know that it's not actually fine. I feel like that is Bill Self when he's like, well, what would you think about running a pick and pop offense where your center can shoot a lot of threes, but he has questions on the defensive side of the ball and playing inside and getting rebounds? You're like, well, that's fine. But is it? Is it fine? So I I do think Zach Clements will get a, a fair shake in this and he'll have an opportunity to show that he can be an interior defender and rebounder. And if he can do those things, then he could be the guy who plays 20, 25 minutes a game because he would be doing the things that you have questions about added to a very um open offensive skill set and same thing for cam martin but i think if i'm leaning one way it's that Ernest uday or zuby edgifer one of those two is going to edge him out because it's going to give you more rim protection it's going to give you more of a rim runner it's going to give you more of a lob threat and those are things that traditionally bill self centers do uh but basically i'm just saying i really have no idea what to expect at center 
but I feel like KJ Adams is the one guy where I'm like, oh yeah, you'll play five to 10 minutes at center. You'll play five to 10 minutes on the wing. Outside of that, I don't really feel great about really anyone on uh, that side of the ball. All right, in just a moment, we're going to go over some season predictions for KU basketball ahead of this season. But first, this episode brought to you by Sweat Block. Obviously, you know, at this time of the year, starting to cool off a little bit, so maybe don't have to worry about it as much. But what happens when you go inside and you're hanging out with friends and you're in a warm, condensed environment and all of a sudden you have pit stains and you're looking around and you're like, oh, man, I'm at a party with friends or I'm hanging out with some people or I'm at a restaurant and it's a little too warm in here and I overdressed for the cold and now I have all these pit stains and I'm embarrassed and I'm worried if I smell bad. Well, don't with sweat block because sweat block gives you the confidence to wear what you want without embarrassing underarm sweat. The sweat block wipes were featured and tested on the Rachel Ray show by firefighters. If it works for firefighters, it's going to work for you. You know, you're probably sitting around all day or you're sitting around inside. You're probably not doing everything that a firefighter does. Right. And if you are, then even better, even better because it works for firefighters. If you or someone you love is experiencing embarrassing sweat or odor, try sweat block. Save 20% with the promo code locked on at sweatblock.com, also available on Amazon. KU heads into the season next week. Their first game, I believe November 7th of the season, they play Duke in the Champions Classic, the third game of the season. I guess the schedule's going right below me, but here's a plug. Watch on YouTube. We have cool graphics and tickers and things to see that you should come on YouTube as well, uh, outside of listening on the podcast here. So, Here's the first question I have for the season prediction. If blank happens, then KU can win a national title again, win back-to-back. Obviously, we haven't seen a team win back-to-back since those Florida teams, which that's a little different. You had a Florida team that won a title. They brought back all those players who were not just like good college players. They were good pros. Joe Kim Noah, Al Horford, Corey Burt, like all those guys came back. That never happens anymore, and they won a title. In fact, they're the only team since, I think, 2002 to even go past the Sweet 16 after winning a title. Everybody else has lost before the Elite Eight. So maybe that should be the bar here. Um, And I guess the caveat here is you can do all these things right and still the tournament can just sneak by you and take you out because the tournament can be so random and weird and make things so difficult on you. But the first thing I would say here, I have two answers to this. If blank happens, then KU can win another title. One, Jalen Wilson is a National Player of the Year candidate. Essentially, if you're a National Player of the Year candidate, you're a first-team All-American, that means you're a top-five player in college basketball. If that happens, it adds so much to this team. It answers a question about, you know, who can be the go-to scorer, which, again, I I feel confident Jalen will be that. But will it be you're confident in him as a scorer, or will it be he's dominant as a go-to scorer in those situations? And maybe it's honestly less about Jalen specifically. Like, if Grady Dick did that, or if Kevin McCuller did that, it's just somebody has to emerge as being one of those guys that you feel like can be a first team all American that you feel like is going to make those biggest plays with the ball in his hand at the end of shot clocks, at the end of the game for you to come through. The second thing is a five man breaks out and is a really good player. It's not just that one of the five man emerges or ends up being your best center. It's that they have to be at least by the end of the season, right? The beginning of the year might be finding your footing, might be having some struggles. By the time we get to February, by the time we get to March, by the time you get to the NCAA tournament, it's gotta be something where you are now, like an all big 12 caliber center at that position, whoever it is, somebody has to emerge has to be at least one person for KU. It's going to be so pivotal the way KU wants to throw the ball down low. uh, Even if it won't be as much as they did last year with David McCormick uh, with having rim protection on the other end. And because, and, and I should clarify like a traditional five man, because I think KJ Adams could excel in that role as a small ball five, but there's going to be times where you're going to need a traditional center to come in there and play well, whether it's a specific matchup in the Big 12 or in the NCAA tournament, that has to happen. So those are the two big things for me. Uh, If I'm making final picks for what this season would be, I'm just going to make the assumption KU wins a a share of the Big 12 title with Baylor. I think Baylor's really good, so I could see them sharing it just like they did last year. Uh, I could see KU earning a, you know, I I could really see KU earning a, a three or a four seed Uh, having a slow start to the year with some of the freshmen. But if I think they're going to win a share of the Big 12, by it being the best conference in college basketball, you're going to rack up so many net wins and everything that if you think they're going to win the Big 12, the lowest seed you should predict them as is probably a two seed. So I'll say they get on the two line this year, and then I'll say you probably lose in like the second round or Sweet 16 just because March can be so fickle sometimes and that this team has a really good year and they have a lot of talent, but 
It's just the numbers have showed the teams who win national championships don't come back and have as much success. So officially, I'll say they win a share of the Big 12, they make it to the Sweet 16, and then maybe you don't go as far as you'd like, and maybe you have some of these young freshmen say, hey, instead of going pro, like I want to accomplish even more, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to be amazing as a sophomore, and then KU hits their stride and gets a one seed and is a top three preseason team the following season. There's my prediction for the season. That'll do it for this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. Coming up on tomorrow's show, we are going to be joined by Scott Chasen. If you have anything you'd like for the show to talk about or want to follow along on the action, you can reach out at D Johnson Radio on Twitter. Don't forget to subscribe to the show so you're getting all the latest with Locked on Jayhawks. Check us out now on YouTube. You can uh, subscribe to the channel or just watch the video itself. That'll do it for today's episode. Have a good rest of your day. I'll see some of you on Rock Chalk Sports Talk later today. Bye.